Goedemiddag iedereen. Welkom iedereen to Wit de Wit. Voor dit symposium on the work of visual artist Sarkis en the work and theory of culture and art historian Abby Warburg. Um, my name is Samuel Salemakers. I am uh, part of Witte de Wit's curatorial team here, led by our director Daphne Ayas, who unfortunately could not be here at this time. Uh, she is part of the jury for um, the Dutch Pavilion in Venice next year, but she will uh, make it here later on today. Um, together with uh, Sarkis and keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Uwe Fleckner, we decided to uh, name this event after the book they both published uh, in 1995 called The Treasure Chests of Mnemosyne. Today, this book has become a rare find in specialized bookstores or online, which is why we not only decided to revive its content through the talks and presentations we will be hearing today, but also to make it available to you and all Witte de Wit visitors. Some of you have probably already seen uh, the installation um, we made uh, next door uh, on the other space. Um, and these reproductions um, we made of the book um, that I already mentioned. I highly recommend and invite you all to have a look at those books about which uh, we will be talking some more later on. We are also very happy to have Sarkis himself here today. Um, but actually Sarkis has been in Rotterdam throughout the whole summer. Some of you might have already visited the wonderful exhibition he has at the Onderzeeboot Lots, organized by Museum Boymans van Beuningen and the Port of Rotterdam. Um, and for those who haven't seen it yet, it's also a definite must perhaps even more interesting after today. Um, before we start, I would like to briefly present to you our speakers. Uh, keynote speaker, as I already mentioned, is Professor Dr. Uwe Fleckner, who teaches art history at the Hamburg University and at Stanford, California. And he is also the founder of the Warburg House at the Hamburg University. Uwe Fleckner was the first to um, draw a connection between the work of Sarkis and um, Abby Warburg's theories. Um, a very interesting text on this subject, an earlier text by Uwe Fleckner, is available on Sarkis' website. So those who are interested in further reading, um, please have a look there. Uwe Fleckner will be giving a conference titled Theatro Memoriae, Sarkis, Warburg and the Display of Images. We have invited fellow art historian Professor Dr. Sven Lutken of the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam to respond uh, to this conference, as he himself has also written extensively on Warburg in relation to art. Upon the kind invitation of Sarkis, our artist in residence, Alexandre Sing, who is working at Witte de Wit since last April onwards, producing his play, The Humans, has selected a text from the treasure chest of Mnemosyne, and will be discussing this text, a fragment from Plato's Phaedrus, with Sarkis, uh, Sarkis later on. Lisbeth Levy, philosopher and artistic director of the UNI, our ongoing collaborator and the debate club here in Rotterdam, will respond to this conversation. We will start with Uwe Fleckner's presentation and Sven Lutken's response, then a short talk about the publication, the book itself, with Uwe and Sarkis, then there will be a break where you can have some soup on the first floor in our consensus bar. And at 6.45, we reconvene and continue with Alexandre Singh and Sarkis. I will leave it at that and please enjoy the program. Yes, um, thank you, um, Samuel, for this nice introduction and uh, especially for the invitation for today. And, uh, and I have to extend uh, my gratitude to the whole um, Witte de Witte team because, um, as you will see, the technique um, is uh, a little bit more sophisticated as we are used to as art historians. Um, and this was only possible by the help of the, the whole team uh, which made this possible. So, um, historicizing the work of a living, active artist and using the ideas of one of history's great intellectuals to explain it is always a very delicate enterprise. 
Such an approach is all too often nothing more than a testament to the insecurity of art historians who are familiar with the texts of the great pioneering minds, say Nietzsche or Freud, Benjamin or Derrida, but succumb to logocentrist anxieties when confronted with the visual idiom of artists' works. Today, we do not want to cast ourselves into that circle of art historians and art critics who close their eyes before the image and prefer to attend to the written word. Nonetheless, we want to establish parallels between the work of a contemporary artist, one possessing great vitality and always presenting himself as new challenges, and that of an important theorist. Zakis and A.B. Warburg, the Turkish-French artist and the German art and cultural historian, are united by an elective affinity, and this affinity expresses itself particularly strongly in their very similar mode of accessing visual phenomena. The primary issue to be discussed is not that Zakis engaged in a direct reception of Warburg in some statement and works, a topic that has already been covered extensively elsewhere. Instead, the visual argument Parallels, rather than points of contact, will provide the main focus of my remarks. For this reason, I will first explain Warburg's visual working method with the help of several central, only recently published display panel projects. However, from the beginning, I will be showing you an extended series of uncommented photographs of selected Warburg's exhibitions. You will already see them on the right in the hope of attaining that visual persuasive power aimed, or aimed at by both Zakis and Warburg, artist and theorist in their works. If we look at the life's work of scholarly achievements by the Hamburg historian of art and culture, Abi Warburg, in terms of the general outlines of his public influence, that is, primarily in terms of his publications as measured in a purely quantitative sense, then we arrive at a surprising result. The late Warburg, that Warburg whose thought has, with very good reason, been the focus of diverse research questions for several years now, published only four, I repeat, four short incidental texts in the years after his release from Ludwig Binswanger's sanatorium in Kreuzlingen in 1924. And yet, the last five years of the art historian's life were extraordinarily productive. They could almost be described as, a defined, as, uh, as defined by a feverish activity. Warburg conducted research. He traveled to advance his work, he wrote note after note, and he certainly did not become silent. He worked on a multitude of lectures and designed his panel and exhibition projects at a breathtaking rate, not just the famous Mnemosyne Atlas, which was to remain a fragment, but also at least a dozen sequences of images to accompany his lectures. You are seeing one of the images on the left side. <clears throat> Through these lectures, he reached a public that was admittedly small, but also increasingly fascinated. It seems likely that Warburg consci consciously <clears throat> chose to communicate his ideas by means of the ephemeral formats of the lecture and the visual presentation. This enabled him to begin to construct the thoroughly complex and unpredictable edifices of his mental architecture in an experimental form and to develop his arguments in, so to speak, a preliminary version without having to rush to cast form and content into a permanent state. Numerous sources document the length of his lectures and the digressive meandering technique of his presentations testify to the experimental nature of his appearances in the laboratory that was his Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek. In particular, his use of the didactic medium of the display panel, 
with its diverse potential for associations and its substitution of visual simultaneity for the unambiguously directional linearity of verbal realization, points to the fact that Warburg's late lectures and the accompanying exhibitions present us with veritable experimental apparatuses. However, it was not first in the years following his psychotic breakdown that Warburg discovered his didactics based on the comparative analysis of visual material. As early as 1905, he not only illustrated his lecture Dürer und die Italienische Antike, Dürer and Antique Italy, held at a Congress of German Philologists in Hamburg with a sequence of slides, but also provided participants from the archaeological section with a three-part set of images at his own expense. You're seeing two of those. He used these to reproduce his, with, um, uh, his most important visual examples, Albrecht Dürer's 1494 drawing of the death of Orpheus in the Hamburg Kunsthalle, and its anonymous counterpart created in Ferrara in the second half of the 15th century. These were preceded by several other examples of Orpheus' iconography on the first page, now on the right, which at that time did not yet achieve the polyfocal, discontinuous, and repeatedly fractured structure of visual argumentation characteristic of the late Warburg um, and his display panels. The art historian himself, nevertheless, described the reproductions generously spread out before his listeners as, I quote, as an historical atlas of the migrating, classicizing language of gesture, and thus also revealed which publications had served as a model of his set of images, the numerous cultural, historical, Philologic, philological atlases that had been assembled in the 19th century, also typically for didactic purposes. The issue of whether the Hamburg art historian can claim intellectual priority regarding his form of visual argumentation and demonstration is entirely insignificant in connection with the question that is to be explored here. The way in which A.B. Warburg's sequences of images operate. Nonetheless, a search for possible impulses behind his epistemological arsenal obviously ought to be pursued. Warburg stated in the fall of 1905 that he had provided a historical atlas of the migrating, classicizing language of gesture, along with the illustrations of his lecture on Dürer and Antique Italy. And, his already of, and this already offers evidence that seems to give an immediate answer to, his, to this question. The title of the projected Nemosyne Atlas, like a central star orbited by the planets of his other panels, also contains this reference, Atlas. The genre of the atlas provided Warburg with access to a type of book that offered a format that was, for the most part, clearly constructed and could look back upon a long tradition on its own. These derived from geographic anthologies of maps, which themselves display an interesting genealogy in the history of publishing and bear an etymology whose roots lead back through the late 16th century and on to antiquity. Collections of images related to astronomy or anatomy, for example, had also been published under this title since the early modern period. The macro and microcosmic measuring of the world found there an appropriate publishing medium in the atlas. The 19th century, the century of encyclopedia, experienced a genuine boom in editions of illustrated surveys of this type, related to every conceivable field of knowledge and generally appearing explicitly under the title of atlas or even picture atlas. These countless anthologies of material, 
particularly material related to the history of art and culture, and more specifically to archaeological and philological themes that had been published in the Atlas format, make it seem appropriate to assume that Warburg adapted for his own purposes this type of publication, which granted the image at least at a certain, uh, a certain primacy over the world. Typically, provided with concise legends, the large formatted illustrations of these atlases inventory a canonical stock of images related to lexically defined terms. They transfer the order of knowledge that is thus guaranteed into the general aesthetic order of each individual page. In the process, the amount of phenomena related to each individual theme is reduced according to what the publishers consider to be of importance, either typically or stylistically influential for a specific epoch of art or cultural history. Types and genres, as well as forms and functions of cult, profane, artistic, and scientific objects are to be explained by means of the provided constellation of images. Historical and stylistic developments are to be reconstructed on the basis of the given individual plate, or also through a sequence of several plates. Nonetheless, it is necessary to point out that the traditional form of the atlases had almost no truly substantial influence on Warburg's methods of visual didactics. Their potential to provide the art historian with impulses and their role as a model necessarily remained marginal because these pre-existing encyclopedic and specialist atlases did not develop any sort of independent visual argumentation. They merely offered an abundance of illustrative material whose status as evidence had not been emancipated from traditional models of history. Simple, typically symmetrical arrangements, paratactic series, and continuous sequences define their compositions. They illustrate linear, development con de developmental concepts of history, and for the most part, do not establish any complex interrelation of the images among themselves. The most important impulse provided to Warburg by the atlases of his time is ultimately likely to have been his recognition of the potential they offered, but in no way exhaustively exploited. For a methodologically bolder comparative analysis of images, in his work on his own lecture exhibitions, as well as the Mnemosyne Atlas, he was then able to develop this potential far beyond the level attained in existing publications. And in that sense, described by Georges Didi Übermann, contre toute l'histoire de l'art positiviste, schématique ou idéaliste. Without a doubt, Warburg succeeded in transforming the positivistic medium of the pictorial atlases into an instrument of analytical scholarship through his intensive work on his display panels in the 20s. However, the art historian was not as exceptional in his project as it's generally suggested by the secondary literature on his influence, P particularly among art publications, a significant number of comparable, comparable experiments in methodology and representation can easily be recognized during the first two decades of the 20th century. In each case, it must be understood that the largely autonomous, often uncommented application of images led to forms of argumentation that, while distinct, were always visually oriented. They thus responded to the skepticism, the crisis even of language, that had become readily apparent in the work of numerous authors of that era. <clears throat> Distantly related to the contemporary art of the collage, which grew out of other sources and pursued other aesthetic aims, the montage of reproductions into informal visual essays 
can be documented as early as 1912 on the basis of a highly prominent example. Vasily Kandinsky and Franz Marc conceived their Almanac, uh, their Blaue Reiter, the Blue Rider, with the express intention of pursuing a comparative form of art history. In a letter from 19 June 1911, Kandinsky clearly formulates the nature of this project. Children's drawings are to be confronted with ancient Egyptian art. Chinese paintings with those by Le Douanier Rousseau and examples of folk art with works by Picasso. And on 24 October 1911, Mark wrote about the planned and subsequently also realized treatment of images in their publication. I quote, the reason that the book is to be so rich in comparative illustrated material is that its value lies in the comparison and not in the individual image. While reading and viewing the Almanac, the expository, expository value of these visual comparisons, which were not motivated by any by any relationship to the text, immediately becomes clear. Despite the fact that its layout was generally not in the atlas form of Warburg sequences of images and that its visual combinatorics took a much more modest form, Der Blaue Reiter should nonetheless be recognized as an incunabulum in a long evolving series of publications partly influenced by and partly parallel to it, stretching far into the 20th century. The Almanac includes many spreads that juxtapose two reproductions, and the visual dialogues staged in this way make it clear that its publishers had a faith in the fundamental comparability of artworks beyond the boundaries of any epochs or media. To name just few examples, you have them in front of you since quite a while, the yearbook confronts Vincent van Gogh's portrait of Dr. Gachet of 1890 with a cleverly chosen detail from a Japanese woodcut and combines Robert Delaunay's cubist painting Tour Eiffel of 1911 with El Greco's John the Baptist of around 1605. These confrontations provide an opportunity to explore the shared depth of their distinctive, expressive dimensions. The purpose of this editorial decision to include these often surprising dialogues is to increase awareness of lasting artistic values and to gain insight into universally valid aesthetic constants which according to the steadfast conviction of the two editors, still continue to shape the art of their contemporary. The Munich Rear book, which was reprinted in 1914, influenced the design of a whole series of post-World War I art and culture periodicals through its conceptual innovations and the innovations in publishing that were founded upon them. The most important perhaps of these publication uh, of these publications was very likely Der Querschnitt, which first appeared in 1921 and maintained a quite high level of circulation into the 30s. The magazine was published first uh, was published by the Galerie Flechtheim in Berlin in Berlin through its comparative representation of image and text, it offered precisely that cross-section of the cultural life and society of the Weimar Republic suggested by its programmatic title, Der Querschnitt, cross-section. Visual wit was to be developed out of astonish astonishing juxtapositions. Exaggerated correspondences between art and life were offered to the reader in tableaus of images that were typically also constructed in terms of a dialogue. Artworks from different epochs were juxtaposed. Unexpected illustrations suddenly cast new light on texts. In the process, the magazine achieved some insight into the afterlife of artistic as well as cultural patterns and often exposed societal norms, social comportment and political symbolism, like you see perhaps on the right, in an entertaining and sometimes also thoroughly political manner. 
The large national and international circulation of Der Querschnitt doubtlessly helped popularize the idea of comparative visual journalism and in thematic forms, uh, terms to push it beyond the narrow boundaries of the fine art. Since that time, comparisons of images providing viewers with insights have become a part of the standard repertoire of avant-garde art journals. Periodicals like L'Esprit Nouveau, you see an example on the left, published in the circle of Le Corbusier and Amédée aux Enfants, and surrealist journals like La Révolution Surrealiste or Minotaur, repeatedly included tableaus of images whose combinatorics display an undeniable structural resemblance to A.B. Warburg's display panel projects, in spite of their entirely distinct communicative aims. It is also important not to conceal the fact that the anti-modern iconoclasm of the National Socialists also adopted the strategies of the montage technique developed by their enemies, perverted them into an instrument of propaganda, and underhandedly deployed them against the progressive art of their contemporaries in the, for example, in the Munich exhibition uh, Entarte to Kunst, Degenerate Art in 1937, and as well in numerous publications. Um, I, show some examples um, right now. Pamphlets like Paul Schulz in Naumburg's Kunst und Rasse, Art and Race from 1928 and Kampf um die Kunst, The Battle for the Arts from 1932. Wolfgang Wilrich's Säuberung des Kunsttempels, The Cleansing of the Temple of Art from 1937 or Adolf Dresler's Deutsche Kunst und Entartete Kunst, German Art and Degenerate art from 1938 featured direct comparisons of works selected from those of early modern German or academic national socialist artists set in opposition to those of the expressionists, cubists, constructivists, and dadaists. They confronted modernist compositions with medical images of handicapped persons, and they relied on the accumulation of denounced visual material. In this way, they sought to document the, the alleged decline of art in the Weimar Republic and to justify the condemnation and confiscation of degenerate works, as well as the persecu persecution of their creators. Returning to the mise en page of avant-garde publications, the journal Document from 1929 to 1931, for which Karl Einstein was responsible, certainly represents an exceptional achievement. The Parisian Review had explicitly taken up as its fundamental editorial principle the re-evaluation of all aesthetic values by means of unforeseen, often shocking visual confrontations between artworks of all genre, media, epochs, and cultures. On its pages, paintings and sculptures, photographs and film stills, comics and commercial graphic art all meet in ever new and always surprising combinations. Here, artifacts of lost civilizations can be seen alongside avant-garde artworks, the masterpieces of advanced civilizations alongside curiosities drawn from trivial or popular culture. By his own account, Karl Einstein followed the work of the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek Warburg with great interest, and he was able to take up and to render fruitful the editorial experiments of early 20th century artists and popular journals for his own idiosyncratic concepts of art history. The countless reproductions in this journal, every issue of which represented a continuous series of images displaying the wealth of humanity's capacity to express itself 
are sometimes organized into short visual essays that comment on topics such as the continuity of problems of artistic form, or that illuminate aesthetic, iconographical, ethnological, or cultural historical contexts. For example, in the sixth issue of 1930, Ralph von Königswald's essay Tet Ekran, Heads and Skulls, is accompanied by a tableau of images that establishes interconnections between a New Caledonian mask, a South American shrunken head, and a gift of dubious worth snuck in by the editors, not mentioned by Königswald at all, a detail from Lukas Kranach's painting of Judas and Holofernes of around 1535 from the Vienna Kunsthistorisches Museum. Thus, in the skulls of ancestors and in the trophy heads of defeated enemies, the powers of the dead magically live on. As editor of Document, Einstein used the juxtaposition of apparently disparate visual material to realize a fundamental serialist principle as demanded by André Breton, a complete and systematic dépaysement, a denaturalization of all things which is necessary in order to help them to attain a new, heightened reality in a new place. It is precisely this confrontational approach that finds its most complete expression in the journal's associative textual and visual strategies. Here, as in the case of Warburg's description of the shelving of the books in his Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek, we could speak of a law of good neighbors. In the document, it is primarily contemporary art's roots in the depth of history that is made apparent by means of an unconventional application of illustrations founded on an anthropological, ethnological basis. Furthermore, in his Aphorisme Methodique, which appeared in 1929 in the journal's first issue and presented a manifesto on Einstein's own scholarly work, he arrives at a new and comprehensive a comprehensive conception of art history as a clash between all visual experience. A conception of art history that was inspired by surrealism and one that document staged more convincingly than any other 20th century journal. L'histoire de l'art et la lutte. The battle, la lutte de toutes les expériences optiques des espaces inventés et des figurations. It is precisely this aesthetic aspect, the collision of images as storehouses of memory, which ignite a new spark of insight when combined that unites the visual rhetoric of artist journals from expressionism to surrealism with Warburg's scholarly experimental apparatuses, in spite of their differences in other respects. As a clash of images, this technique still fascinates today's artists. In his atlas, begun in 1962, for example, Gerhard Richter has assembled a heterogeneous collection of images for potential or actual use in his work, as well as private photos, artistic experiments, and images documenting his critique of the media. Hanne Darboven's Kulturgeschichte 1880 to 1983 is an overabundant archive that is arranged in violation of archival principles and contains a century's worth of historical, popular, and journalistic visual material. These are just two of the most obvious examples exhibiting key characteristics of precisely that form of confrontation of images that also typify the intellectual tableau projects of the first half of the century. The fact that the analogies between these works and Warburg's Nemocini Atlas in particular relate not only to structure but also to content can be explained through the work on collective memory that predominates in each case and that is realized with equal success through the journalistic, scholarly and artistic montages mentioned here. The way in which Warburg constructed the combinatory procedure of his sequences of images and his exhibitions can be illustrated with the help of countless examples. 
If we take a look at the fifth panel of his lecture, Die Funktion der nachlebenden Antike bei der Ausprägung energetischer Symbolik, the function of antiquities afterlife and the definition of energetic symbolism from 1927, which he held to celebrate the 60th birthday of his brother Max, then we will have something like a typical Warburg panel before our eyes. Twelve exhibits are gathered on a black support Most of them are photographic reproductions of the selected works. The central object of inquiry, the iconography of the death of Orpheus, represented by, a folio, by the folio pages from 1905, which you have already seen, is surrounded by an abundance of images, additional representations of scenes depicting the human figure in its intense situations involving battle or conflict. For example, the antique Laocon group, an antique battle scene from the first century before Christ, which was reused for the Arch of Constantine, as well as Christian scenes. The release of physical as well as psychological tension is sometimes depicted in the pathetic mode of antiquity and, at other times, in the comical mode of folk art. The work on heterogeneous pictorial solutions is then documented through early Renaissance examples whereby Dürer's works mark a threshold of sorts. The result is a highly interesting constellation designed to illuminate the problem of mastering passion by tracing the geographical historical transfer of its motives. The panel can thus be described as an exemplary visualization of Warburg's understanding of the Pathos formula, the Pathos formula, and pursues its aim in relation to highly agitated scenes that reach back to the depth of the interactions between northern and southern European art. It is no chronological not to mention teleological or otherwise linear sequence from antiquity to renaissance that is presented here. Instead, Warburg presents a set diagram of energized figures, which simultaneously generates the proposed polar or multipolar nature of the historical development by means of the direct and constantly renewed confrontation between images, reveals the complex evolution from a passionately agitated myth to a metaphor of Christian self-control and thus plainly demonstrates the energetic symbolism of the afterlife antiquity of antiquity to the panel's viewers. Compositionally, this means that Warburg did not construct a paratactic joining of his examples, but rather a highly dense confrontational clash of images And this renders undeniably apparent the intellectual proximity between the layout of these panels and the anthropologically based art history that Einstein formulated at approximately the same time. La lutte de toutes les expériences optiques. <coughs> We have seen a panel that is relatively easy to take in. However, other examples reveal the complexity that Warburg's arrangements could develop. Not only the incredible large numbers of reproductions in a highly constricted space, for example, most of the panels from the sequence of images related to Manet and Antique Italy um, contain well over 50 exhibits on each, on each uh, screen. But also the heterogeneity of the media involved and an extremely dense compositional structure present viewers with substantial challenges, particularly because of the fact that almost all of Warburg's display panels now exist in the absence of commentaries. Above all else, however, the layout of his sequences of images shows how finely the fabric of Warburg's thought was typically woven. Various thematic clusters can be recognized in some densely packed panels, whereby the reproductions can be combined with, own, with one another in every direction, and viewers' attention is thus repeatedly directed in new fields of interest. 
Warburg sometimes achieved the argumentation pattern of his atlas and exhibition panels by handling images in a way whose comparison with cinematographic means, zoom, sequences, flashbacks, brings some insight into this work whereby it is certainly possible that the art historian developed the corresponding, corresponding techniques independently of his quite limited familiarity with film. In summary, it is appropriate to conclude that the idiosyncratic visual rhetoric of Warburg's panels attempt to convince viewers with an argumentation structure that is equally polyphone and polyfocal and whose operation can hardly be reduced to a single common denominator. A rich abundance of examples from antiquity to the contemporary is arranged into compositions whose autonomous syntax obeys no verbal strictures. Horizontal rows or vertical columns of images do occasionally appear. However, these are usually broken up again through open lines of relation. Both the historical development of motives and their reversions are displayed. Discontinuous material comes into contact and conflict. The montage combines both homogeneous and heterogeneous visual elements and Warburg's concept of the polar opposition of cultural history is expressed in many panels by the fact that clearly contradictory perspectives on the visual material are simultaneously constructed. The chosen spaces between images are fundamentally responsible for preserving a tensely charged distance between the individual elements of the composition, one that permits, as in the case of the early 20th century montages, sparks of new insight to leap from one image to the next. Here, we are dealing with releases of energy like those that we can occasionally observe in the energetic gestures of Warburg's own schematic drawings, particularly when these sketches take the form of spontaneous preliminary designs. In their status as open formations of knowledge, the Hamburg art historians' sequence of images thus have both an epistemic and an aesthetic dimension. Their layout is aimed at intellectual as well as sensual insight. Warburg's manner of lecturing had nothing at all in common with the rigid formalities of academic proclamations of truth and was something entirely different. Experiment, risk-taking, provocation, and in particular a very earnest attempt to come to terms with the history of human suffering by means of the history of its depiction. In the face of his lectures, it would hardly be exaggerated to split the term demonstration in two and to understand his didactic method in terms of a demonstration, with whose aid the art and cultural historian attempted to hold at bay those psychological monstra that had, been, uh, that had beset him throughout his life. The clash of images, individual and collective memory, the demonstration of threatening visual phenomena, the pathos of visual expression, these are not only key concepts for understanding Warburg, but also essential aspects of the art of Sakis. His work circles in diverse ways around the emotionality of life experiences, of suffering and happiness, of childhood and death, and of how they become images, both his, installation, in his uh, installations and his autonomous individual works repeatedly explore the works of artists, musicians, and writers, which serve both as models and as artifacts of experienced time. In short, objects in which emotional experiences have crystallized into visual memories. In this sense, Zakis is to be described as one of the greatest historians or even more precisely, psychohistorians among contemporary artists. And this alone would also be sufficient reason to justify a comparison to the psychohistorian Warburg, who integrated artistic methods, particularly the montage technique, into his scholarly work. 
let us therefore first take a look at several series of motives to which Zarkis has devoted himself in his role as a historian of the human soul. One of art history's most famous sculptures, one which we have already seen as an object of Warburg's inquiry into images, is a life-sized late Hellenistic figure group that, has, that was created in the first century before Christ. It shows Laocoon and his sons struggling against two giant serpents. According to Virgil, the priest had aroused the wrath of the goddess Athena by warning the Trojans to beware of the cunning Odysseus wooden horse. Laocoon and his two sons are trapped in the serpent's grip. With tensed bodies and despairing gestures, they vainly attempt to free themselves from the danger that will lead to the death of the father and his sons. According to antique sources, Agesander, Atemodorus, and Polydorus were the three sculptors who created the work, composing its violent action in the dramatic form of a triangle. Laocon's arm extends high above the group. He attempts to tear away the serpent that has bit into his thigh, and his body, with its expansive gesture, thus represents both a motive and an almost abstract sign for pain. Warburg would have spoken of a pathos formula. The arms and legs just out from the body, creating angular forms. His head and those of his sons is twisted sharply out of the axis of the body. The result is a violently broken line, of composition define the structure of the group of figures. Finally, the bearded father's mouth is opened, as if he were about to scream. However, despite the extent of his suffering, his face is only barely disrupted, and he maintains an expression of dignified composure in the face of divine punishment. As a turn, at the turn of the 20th century, an artwork that was certainly equally significant took on the task of depicting the theme of human suffering, which find its strongest human expression in the scream. Edward Munch's painting, The Scream of 1893, shows a stylized figurine of a man standing on a dock or bridge in front of a broad landscape that has been broken up into abstract color. He has drawn his hands to the sides of his head actually a skull, whose ocular cavities and mouth are torn open, torn open in horror. While considerations of artistic appropriateness, the so-called decorum, lets the sculptors of antiquity to decide to, to, say, to take much less the scream of La Ocon than its painful suppression as their subject matter, the modern painter could permit himself to depict the scream itself in the image. And this scream is heard by every viewer. It is heard through the shrill contrasts with which Munch invests the anxiety of the figure in an unbearable resonance that is comparable to musical dissonance. Cold colors conflict with warm colors, and biting contrasts between red, yellow, and violet cause the cry of terror to bellow out of the painting. Here. The divine punishment that an antique worldview could define as the source of human suffering has been replaced by an existential spiritual threat. The fear of humanity can no longer be traced back to a higher power. No, humanity itself and the world it lives in are responsible for the suffering of the individual. At the end of the 20th century, in February 1998, Zakis created a short film entitled Au commencement le cri, in the beginning there was the scream. It offered an updated version of Munch's work in the space of three minutes and five seconds. The artist had set a simple white bowl of water next to a reproduction of the work. The viewer can see how a brush is used to gradually deposit watercolors onto the surface of the water, colors corresponding to those of the painting that serves as a model, and how they slowly sink into the water like clouds. They gradually intertwine themselves into a knot of colors, and a certain time form thus takes on a dissonant tone, 
a voice made up of color values. In the fleeting of watercolor, the motive of anxiety, expressed through a figure by Munch, dissolves into abstract form and rapidly becomes nothing more than a memory that is provided with a more permanent existence only by the film. Life is also fleeting like the watercolors dipped into the bowl of fresh water with a brush. And like the watercolors, human events also mark life with their fleeting traces for a shorter or longer period of time. We find these traces in our memories. We find them in works of literature and of art. Let us take a look at a few more examples. In the so-called Alexander Sarkophagus of the Istanbul Archaeological Museums, created around 330 before Christ for the royal necropolis in Sidon, an anonymous sculpture has depicted scenes from a battle between Greek and Persian soldiers. At the far left of the relief, Alexander the Great has been carved as an almost freestanding figure, which still shows traces of paint from a rearing horse, though he thrusts his lance towards his opponent, whose own horse has collapsed. On the right side, more figures can be seen in desperate hand-to-hand -hand combat. In the middle, a fleeing Persian with his hand raised to protect himself, has been used to establish a figural transition between the two halves of the relief. His body is turned to the left, but his head to the right. The sculpture develops an entire catalog of dramatically moved gestures. The positions of the hands have been varied to create every conceivable form of expressive pictorial, pictorial science. At the far left and right of the work, they are raised in order to attack. Fists and bent arms are held before the faces for protection, twice in the middle of the images, for example. Hands are also, as in the case of the fallen soldier, at the bottom of the middle of the scene, laid on top of each other in complete inactivity. The entire pathos of attack and resistance and of struggle against and the resignation toward death have thus founded their sculptural expression in the various gestures of the depicted hands. A 16th century painting depicts an entirely different theme in a very similar way. Matthias Grünewald's famous crucifixion from the Isenheim Altarpiece, painted from 1512 to 15, shows the scorched body of Christ on the cross accompanied by John Mary and Mary Magdalene, as well as John the Baptist in keeping with traditional Christian iconography. The silhouettes of the figures stand out sharply before the sinister, even dismal landscape. Their hands, in particular, are thus endowed with sharp contours. The suffering of the Savior has taken on a form that can almost be described as crystalline in the cramped hands. The two women expressively stretch their own folded hands towards the crucified Christ, and John the Baptist points with his gothically elongated finger at, the, at he who, if we read the accompanying Latin inscription, of he who will rise again after his death. It is not surprising that the highly pathetic crucifixion by Grunewald fascinated those 20th century artists, such, such as Otto Dix or Pablo Picasso, who sought to invest the images in their own works with a strongly expressive character. In his own artistic work, Zarkis has also repeatedly made reference to to this key work of late medieval German art. His Icona 43, to name just one example, takes up the motive of Mary Magdalene's intertwined fingers, paints them in with, in with green and red watercolors, and then places the sheet in a 19th century wooden frame from Alsace in order to play on the location of Grünewald's Altarpiece in Colmar. Zarkis's work isolates the dramatic gesture from its iconographical context and thus elevates the Christian motive into a symbol, a general symbol, of the universal human experience of suffering. The isolated image of the two hands, separated from their body as well as from Christian myth, invests expressiveness with a manifest visual form whose suffering, supplicating, and despair can be understood 
even by viewers who do not recognize the reference to Grunewald's painting. This small format work is part of an open series of works by the artists, the so-called iconas, icons. Since 1985, Zakias has developed an inexhaustible variety of materials in producing these works. Watercolors, graphite and ink, pigments and chalks are used, but also beeswax and paraffin wax, modeling clay, and small found objects, particularly small votive images, ex voti. Various papers, photographs, postage stamps, and prints are placed within historical frames or glued directly onto the sometimes simple but often elaborate frames. A motley abundance of images and signs is the result. Abstract configurations alternate with figural images. Text and color are both utilized as expressive means. Fingerprints are pressed onto the framed sheets and onto glass or mirror as well. And a dialogue is almost always established between the products of art and commentaries offered by the various forms and motives of the frames. Today, this open series has come to include well over 200 objects, which are exhibited in ever-shifting constellations, both alone or together with other works by the artist, and also set in a comparative relationship to works drawn from the history of art, from medieval time to Joseph Beuys. Zarkis' work, works are arranged on walls that permit viewers to create their own free associations between the individual works. This form of display establishes a deliberate oscillation between the iconostasis of orthodox Christianity with their display of images of saints and the demonstrations of Warburg's display models, uh, panels. All of these examples, Laocon and Munch, the ancient sarcophagus and Grunewald, as well as their artistic reception through Zarkis, uh, from interconnected series of iconographic, iconographical motives and forms. However, the actual historical relationship is complex and must be described very differently in each case. It is highly unlikely that Munch was thinking of the ancient figure group as a model while painting his image at the outer limits of psychological experience. Matthias Grunewald cannot even have known the Ionian relief of the Alexander sarcophagus because it was not discovered until 1887. All the same, we are dealing here with an unconscious one could almost say subcutaneous influence by previously developed solutions of pictorial problems, a relationship that can in no way be described by means of a simplistic art historical model of stimulus, copy, paraphrase, and is best understood by means of Warburg's concept of afterlife. This fascinating evolution of visual articulations has been studied in the modern area in 19th century models for the study of the sciences and humanities and above all in the work of Warburg. In particular, the artworks function as a sort of aesthetic defense against and against and sublimation of painful experiences was a central focus. The role of the artist was explored, who, like a seismograph, traces the shocks of occurrences of suffering that are geographically or historically distant, and then articulates and expresses them in the work of art. Following the foundation of his Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek, Warburg pursued the afterlife of ancient pathos formulas as the central objects of his research. In April 1928, he attempted to reduce his concept of the artwork as a product and vehicle of coping with anxiety with the social memory to a single core statement. I quote, the treasury of human suffering becomes a possession of mankind. Again, the treasury of human suffering becomes the possession of mankind. The artwork thus serves to establish distance and performs a defensive function 
just as a phobic reflex inscribes itself into the central nervous system of the individual human being in the form of a stimulus, psychological engram, in an attempt to objectify anxiety sources in the inexplicable and the anxiety laden by means of a remembered image. Humanity's expression of suffering, its laments, mourning, melancholy, and despair are captured in the image of an aesthetically refined gesture. The individual and collective visual memories thus create um, a reflective distance between humanity and the irrational threat. These Excuse me. These visual articulations, referred to by Warburg as Pato's formulas, store up the energies of gestural articulations and thus, in a sense, represents a storehouse of engrams of human suffering as deposited by artists in the edifice of memories that is art. This conception of the work of artists as responding not only to the shocks of their own soul but also and in particular, to those shocks that reached them from the past, was also instinctively discovered by Zarkis in the concept of treasury of suffering. I quote Zarkis, with this concept, I suddenly had the feeling of coming up against the inner accumulation of memory and the suffering on account of this memory, against that which had piled up inside. However, in order for something to accumulate, it has to take on form. A form has to be created so that memory, and thus a treasury, can appear. And in this sense, it is extremely painful, painful work. Dealing with suffering always means developing an, an energy, finding a form, in order to deal with the memory of suffering." End of quote. Consequently, in his most recent work, the artist has applied this concept whenever working with the artwork in terms of a storehouse of energies derived from the experience of emotion. This was the case when Zarkis illustrated this concept itself and in a 1990 watercolor presented it as a sort of Pandora's box from which suffering seems to flow in the form of a blood red cloud. It was also the case when the artist gave his, this name to a 1991 installation displaying charred wooden models of his current and former studio spaces, thus making clear that the place where the artist works becomes a power plant itself, one that transforms the energy of human emotion into artistic form by means of the work on memory. Zakis seeks to free those energies of the individual and collective capacity for memory that are stored in the objects. I quote again, my work is always bound to memory. Everything in my life is there. History is a kind of treasure. It belongs to us. Everything that has happened in history belongs to us. Everything human that has come into being, suffering, love, is in us, and that is our greatest treasure. And everything I have experienced, lived through and done, that is my treasure. And if, with art, one can make it concrete and visible, an object of experience, one can then travel with these forms, one can then open borders instead of clothing them." End of quote. In the mythology of antiquity, the goddess of memory, Mnemosyne is referred to as the mother of the muses. Memory is thus identified as the origin and foundation of all arts. Antiquity allegorically idealized memory, the mother of all knowledge and thought. Above all, uh, above all however, it cultivated a metaphorical landscape from which contemporary research into memory still draws its terminology. Even today, the wax tablet in which the traces of memory are inscribed and the treasury in which the remembered images are stored, sometimes modernized in the metaphors of photography or the archive, will still continue to define our conception of the uses and disadvantages of the human capacity for memory. It is also this embodiment of memories which were thought to have been lost 
in pictures and objects that invests the elements in Zakis' installations with their special significance. The tesauros of the treasures accumulated here, whether fragments from the history of art and culture or of a very private iconography, is to be characterized as a system of sites of memory in which humanity's social memory, humanity's social memory is stored. Upon their interrogation by artists and viewers, these recount the past. In the work by Zakis, the sculptures and everyday objects, the audio tapes and handwriting of the artist's constructions house, house both individual and collective history and arrange them within the mnemonic architecture of an installation. At the same time, however, Zakis reminds the viewer of his work that the chain of living tradition has been broken for modern humanity and that the historicizing culture of paper memories, a culture of archives, inventories and museums, has displaced an authentic memorial culture. The task and aim of Zakis' artistic work is to free each individual object from the aesthetic isolation in which it is imprisoned, for example, within the museum and the archive. Whether an artwork or an everyday object marked by the traces of bygone days, the object finds its home in the artist's installation in the form of a fragmentary memory of past emotion. Zakis assembles the found and the formed objects into treasuries of articulate, articulated visual memories. As a reservoir of the powers of memory, they release the energies stored within them. Let us take a look at a few more recent works by Zakis in order to see how the artist links entirely personal experiences with historical ones. In 2002, for example, Zakis realized a work in the Musée d'Art Contemporain in Lyon, which was entitled La Bibliothèque de Sarajevo, visitée par le piano Fourneau, the library of Sarajevo visited by the piano slash oven. A tart piano, piano sculpture, which Zakis had already made use of in previous exhibitions, views the photograph of a destroyed library. The library in the photo is the National Library of Sarajevo, which had bur burned down only 10 years before, in the summer of 1992, during a bloody civil war. The impressive building is entirely destroyed, except for the exposed ar arcades. Piles of rubble have been collected within, its, uh, within it, columns, drums, and other fragments. Wheelbarrows can be seen in the abandoned building, waited to be used. The artist has confronted the photographic document, whose motive alone is sufficient to make it a political anti-war statement, with a very personal object, the piano, a sculptural symbol of the artist's musical knowledge and tastes, has been conceived in terms of a mere skeleton of the musical instrument. It is incapable of playing music, but still, Viewers perceive a monotone, sad melody of black tones when they gaze upon its painted form, which also appears burnt. The installation just juxtaposes the conditions of injury, a fear of the loss of private artistic achievement, and the hindering of the playing and hearing of music as an intimate occurrence with the public destruction of culture. The devastated architecture of the library becomes the setting of a silent music. In his 2002 work, Le Défilé du siècle en fluo, the parade of the century in fluorescent fabric, Zakis had 19 children put on 19 costumes, representing different decades of the 20th century, and visit an exhibition um, in the Hessisches Landesmuseum Darmstadt once a week. The exhibition confronted the works of the museum's co collection with his own. The children are no ordinary exhibition goers. They ran, danced, and laughed in their colorful clothes, and they brought life into the museum. Then they were confronted with artworks that bore a different form of life within them, the existence of living artworks. With their gestures and gesticulations, 
with the ever new patterns that they formed in space, the children could be compared to the painted and sculpted bodies of many figural works from the history of art. However, among these living individuals, expressive gestures did no, not congeal into solid form. The children of an entire century, yes, the century itself, ran through the exhibition and began its dialogue with the Block Boys, for example, installed there in 1977, with the 19th century paintings of Arnold Böcklin and others, and with the work of, of Zakis himself. The children's energy, their cheerfulness, and also their seriousness when confronted with enigmatic artworks collided with the energy stored within the artworks. Once more, Zakis's method is the one of confrontation. His art brings together works from different epochs and comments upon them through its own visual idiom. Structurally, the principle behind this work is thus intimately related to the bold arrangement of Warburg's panels. One last current example may help us to make this point more completely clear. In 2010, during an extensive retrospective at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, Zakis confronted the collection of the Musée, of the Musée National d'Art Moderne, for example, works by Malievich and Boys and the studio of Brancusi with his own work. One of the central works in this exhibition, and in my opinion, a defining work within Zakis' entire oeuvre, sought a confrontation with the so-called studio wall of André Breton that fragment that was arbitrarily expropriated from history, that was once alive and has now been musealized and entirely misunderstood, that compilation of European and non-Western artworks, artifacts, and natural objects, which has now been petrified into a work of art itself, but which the surrealist author and theorist had once spent decades collecting and repeatedly altering in his home in the Rue Fontaine. As a living collection, Zakis's Vitrine des Innocents, containing meticulously selected ethnographic objects extending forward all the way to comic book characters of our century, reminds viewers of the original, not exclusively aesthetic, function of those objects among which Breton lived and worked. In its memorial currency, the Arcus's vitrine rebels against the frigid historicization of the museum. For a few weeks, Breton's collection was provided with a new, living currency. This intervention by Zakis once again impressively demonstrated his intellectual proximity to Warburg's confrontational working method. Zakis' work resists the world historical amnesia that forgets the daily experiences of individual uh, individuals on account of the course of world developments. It consists of those images and artifacts from every epoch into which the memory of humanity has etched itself and caused its experience to become form. In his con continuously altered installations, Zarkis has found a form in which the artwork can store and come to terms with both personal and collective experiences, a fluid form. The idiosyncratic structure of the artist's works derives particularly from the fact that it is to be characterized as fundamentally open and has no subject to completion. His installations are rearranged when transferred from side to side. The individual found objects and artifacts, fragments of daily life and artworks, some of which have already been accompanying the artist on his journeys around the world for decades, are subject to a constant metamorphosis. They are constantly assembled into new groups and they are constantly altered in terms of their aesthetic form. Zarkis's installation tell of world events, inner perceptions, experiences, and the suffering that viewers often imagine to be so far removed from themselves. A poetic truth, the logic of the dream and the inoxorability of images converge into a score whose visual text makes its way to our perception in as many registers. Flashes of dramatic climax and isolated moments of peace and happiness form a theatrically mise en scène. 
played out before the eyes of the viewer. The artist also takes on an unusual role in, his, in this staged form of exhibition. With the voices of the world, he captures private and world historical experiences, nearly unbearable voices full of beauty and horror, lyrical monologues full of intimacy, dialogues of things can be heard. The artist becomes a seismograph that records the mnemonic waves of his inner world, but also of the outer, sometimes very distant world. Sarkis, the historian of the soul, and Warburg, the artist among historians, both are bound together by their great faith in the image, their faith in the fact that human experiences become images that perform work on memory and protect contemplative individuals from the monsters that threaten them. But both also know that these images must be induced to speak. The work of the artist and the scholar alike, is to arrange those conflicts between images that are necessary for this purpose, to initiate confrontations between the visual statements displayed in their art and scholarship, and to challenge us, the viewers, to collaborate in this process. Let us take a look, and let us also trust in the universal language of images, which come to grips with the events of the world and make them bearable where our imageless reason would often fail us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilf Lechner. Um, I suggest I give the word to Sven Lütiken. Please. Okay, I should <laughs> say that my uh, response will be rather Warburg-centric, uh, so it may be slightly boring to people who are not Warburg nerds, but uh, then again, boredom is in danger of becoming extinct in our uh, smartphone and laptop society, so we'll be, we'll be doing our bit to uh, ensure the afterlife, the nachleben of boredom. Right, um, Uwe Fleckner, thank you very much uh, for this um, talk. I find your account of uh, Warburg's visual and aesthetic practice very rich and very stimulating, in particular your uh, emphasis on the uh, connection between Warburg's uh, gestures uh, during his lectures and the pathos formal on the pictures, in other words, on the performative dimension of his lectures, and also your focus on the interrelations between Warburg's use of, of montage, of uh, clashing images, and um, those in early 20th century avant-garde uh, journals. Now, of course, as you noted, Warburg had some very distinct aims with his uh, combinatorics, and uh, I want to, you know, I would like to try to focus a bit on those um, distinct aims. Um, and I would want to read two brief quotations from the text of your lecture, which was kindly given to me by Witte de Witt. Uh, you state that it is no chronological, not to mention teleological or otherwise linear sequence from antiquity to renaissance that is presented here in one of his panels. So no chronological, not to mention teleological or otherwise linear sequence. And um, you also remark that while the path of the gaze through the given constellation of images is not entirely open, it is not unambiguously defined either. And um, certainly not directed towards a previously determined gain in knowledge pursued in a one-dimensional sense chronologically, for example. Now, this is a kind of beautiful encapsulation of, indeed, the intricate way in which Warburg's uh, Tafeln, his Bildertafeln, his Atlas uh, pages, or his, his picture tables function. So the gaze um, is guided, but um, there is no unambiguous course. Uh, 
Now, uh, on the other hand, in some of Warburg's writings, and as you mentioned, you know, there's not a whole a lot of them. He was not a very prolific author, and certainly not during his uh, during the last years of his life. But in the writings that he did produce. Um, Warburg does often overlay a highly linear and even teleological um, narrative on his subjects. Time and again, as you know, he repeats this basic idealist narrative in a kind of shorthand, a narrative derived in part from Ernst Cassirer that presents art, especially visual art, as the link between a primitive um, stage of culture which was dominated by magic and a higher stage dominated by science. Um, and humanity has moved from this, uh, from an Andachtsraum to a Denkraum, from a primitive world dominated by, um, let's say, a, a religious and magical um, take on the world to a distanced, um, scientific, uh, enlightened um, attitude. And in his text, for instance, on Manet's Dejelé sur l'herbe and uh, the relation between Manet's composition uh, of Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe and Raphael's uh, River Gods, um, he states tellingly that Manet knew his Rousseau. So Manet participated in establishing a post-mythological enlightened view of nature, whereas Raphael still showed us these elementary uh, uh, deities. Um, and um, Manet, of course, shows us modern uh, bohemians and demi mondaine having a, having a picnic in the park. Um, so, and for understandable reasons, this opposition between primitive magic and uh, modern science took on a particularly shrill form in what must have been the performance of a lifetime, Warburg's lecture uh, on the snake ritual at the uh, Kreuzlingen Mental Hospital, where he... Um, states explicitly that we as a culture, we as humanity, must leave behind the snake image, the snake image that the Indians used, uh, which was the Indian sort of mythological take on lightning coming down from the sky, right? They saw, according to Warburg, they interpreted uh, lightning coming down as, as this kind of snake coming down. So we must use, we must leave behind this snake image, which only leads us to uh, what he calls the subterranean primitive, and we must seek out the sun, enlightenment. Uh, we have to leave behind our inner in Indian and we must embrace a vergeistigende distanzierung, a spiritualizing distanciation. But of course, Warburg also warns us that modern science will in the end actually destroy the sense of critical distance that science has created in the first place. Um, he um, sort of encapsulates it in this beautiful phrase, Telegram und Telefon zerstören den Kosmos. Telegram and telephone are destroying uh, the cosmos, God knows what he would have made of the internet. Oh boy. Yeah, it would pr probably have caused another psychotic uh, breakdown in him. Um, anyway, I'm coming to my but question. That's a very um, sophisticated technique of, of displaying images also. Of course, I mean, we, we, we so constantly, they, when we're lecturing as you yeah. did, we're constantly making our own uh, sort of uh, picture atlases. Absolutely. Okay, let's see if I can kind of wrap this up and put it in the form of a question now. Basically, my question is, how do we deal with this kind of montage? So there is this montage that Warburg creates visually on his tables. There is also the montage between Warburg, the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, visual practitioner, and Warburg, the, the writer and uh, thinker who is not logocentric by any means, but who kind of desperately tries to convince himself that there is this uh, progress, right? That we move from magic via art to science. Uh, and on the other hand, of course, Warburg does see that uh, this uh, progress is never final, that it is never actually, the story is never closed, the narrative never really comes to an end, because the Indians still exist, we still have this Nachleben of the snake ritual, uh, and of course Warburg's whole notion of Nachleben, of afterlife, is focuses precisely on what Hegel perhaps would call the, the Abfall, of, of historical development. Um, so the triumph of, of reason is never complete. And um, yeah, we have to deal with these survivals. Um, but at the same time, um, yeah, on one hand, we have this linear teleological narrative. On the other hand, we have these survivals, these returns, these repetitions. How would you say um, um, do Warburg's um, visual montages, his visual clashes, um, feature in this mm. perpetual tension, this perpetual dialectic? Mm. Um, first of all, one has to admit that, um, that um, his, 
let's say, um, um, verbal argumentation and his um, visual argumentation, um, they, um, they are not consistent. Um, this is uh, that we have to um, have to admit. Um, it starts with his name of those, um, like you see it on the right, um, with those screen organizations. He calls them Bilderreihen, series of images, and this is everything but no series, what we can see. So he invented something and he could not even find the proper name because he was himself so, um, yeah, it was so new for him also. So his visual argumentation is a little bit different than his um, um, theoretic approach to this. Um, and um, you have wonderfully sketched out the oppositions between a linear a linear progressive model and a kind of desperate open model with no aim um, for humanity on, on, on the way of uh, um, humanity. Um, and when you look to the text, you will find out that he is always, as you, as you um, summarized it, he is always looking for this aim and declares what has to be done to achieve a status of um, enlightenment, uh, for example. But then, in some texts, he said, and then the development will swing back. So this is a, a, a pendulum which moves back and forth. Um, and it's very interesting. Um, when we, we are dealing with historical models of the 19th, 20th, 20th century, for, we have this uh, positivistic model of, a, of pro progressive, linear, a development. This is a very simple model. And we have another model, also very sim simple, and this is a cycle. So we are trying, we are trying, we are going, going always, we are cycling, we are going all, always back. Um, Warburg's model is much more complex, and we cannot put it in a, in a simple metaphor. And so that means he cannot describe it in text. And I think this was the crucial point at which he decided I have to do something else and not going on with writing text. Well, writing text means I have to put one word after the other. And in order to explain what I want to say, I have to find a metaphor, which I do not find. So what he is doing is he, 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 he creates a visual text, which is much more complex in relation. And this is, and, and I, I really have to say, you have to make it screen after screen if you want to analyze it. Um, you cannot, um, you cannot use the, the images on, on a single screen as vocabulary and just find the correct order. This is not, uh, this is not possible. On the other hand, it's not uh, impossible to uh, connect whatever you like and jump from one to the other. This is not um, uh, uh, possible also because choosing one image big and the other small gives a certain hint. Um, and he makes variations, um, choosing one uh, reproduction in, in a, a photo, one in a drawing, one in a, in a reproduction graphic, let's say um, from an older century, makes sense all the time. Um, bringing those photographs closer together or more far away has to tell something. And you have to take into account everything to make what your own texts about it, which is a compl which is a, a failure every time you try to make a, a, um, a, a consistent text. You you are trying to make the same mistakes Warburg tries to avoid <laughs> when he when he um, puts it. So we have to accept that there is a that there is a, a, a historic model which is far too complex to be put into a simple metaphor. Yeah, and I do, I do think that you're right that we shouldn't make the sort of logocentric mistake of assuming that. The truth, you know, Warburg's truth is in his writings that, okay, he uses this theory of history or he uses this kind of schematic account of history. Therefore, mm. uh, that is his genuine, you know, his fundamental theory of history. Perhaps, indeed, the real theory is individual articulation. But at the same time, can we, we cannot, I would say, uh, see this visual articulation um, as an autonomous articulation, right? I mean, if I have one beef with George Didi Uberman, whom I admire immensely, it's that occasionally, you know, he kind of downplays the parts of Warburg's whole intellectual makeup that he doesn't like. 
Mm -hmm. And I would say that, uh, you know, this whole Ernst Cassirer derived theory, it's there. And perhaps we should look at his uh, visual practice as, let's say, the breakdown uh, of that theory. Yeah, yeah. not only because um, we tend to think that this is autonomous, no. um, because we do not have a consistent text. But you always have to remember this text existed unfortunately not written down, but there was Warburg standing in front of those screens, and we have, um, we have witnesses and documents that he was talking for four and a half hour on those screens, about those screens. He made uh, presentations in, um, in his library. Um, and he wanted he would have, he would have loved this pub public because you're not, you not 250 p people. He would say, come with me, go with me, and, and we have sources. Come to the screen, we go there, and I explain it in front of you, and then we walk to the next, and then to the third. Um, so performing in front of them, and imagine Warburg in front of Laokon and declaring that Laokon has doing this and that, and he's dancing like a snake ritual in front of his own. So this becomes a, a performative um, um, action. Um, and we have clear evidence, few, but very distinct evidence, that th they say he liked to perform directly with, with a standing public. Um, and then, of course, um, and they said, and it lasted three hours, three and a half hours, four hours. So imagine this. This is uh, very so. But this nobody has recorded this. Nobody has filmed this. This would be the text that we would need. And this text, I can imagine, would not be a text to be printed. We have some fragments of of his notes. You hardly can print them. You can quote fragments. To to this is what we have done when we um, edited all the visual material of his um, of his um, of his panel projects. Um, but you have to create your own text with his fragments. There is no or very very uh, rare uh, consistent text. But of course, in his writings and in these notes, there are these um, there are these uh, um, um, hymns almost these hymns mm -hmm. to to mm -hmm. progress, right? Mm -hmm. And to sure. uh, you know. Uh, Uncle Sam, uh, the modern American, walking in front of a classicist building and the telegraph poles and mm -hmm. uh, lightning or electricity having been um, uh, put to uh, put in the service of, of modern industry, etc., etc. But at the same time, in this very principle of the fragment and also in this principle of montage, there is the perpetual, perhaps not the breakdown, but the perpetual complication mm -hmm. of any such account. And if you look at uh, any particular table, you can always in some way, or you can often relate it in some way to this, to these sweeping statements, but at the same time you kind of mm. get lost, mm. and there are all kinds of patterns and all kinds mm -hmm. of pathways that do not necessarily accord with this, um, mm -hmm. with this narrative. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can give a very um, good illustrative example. Um, when he once created an, an, uh, an architecture for one of these shows that was in the Hamburg Planetarium where he created an, um, an exhibition on the history of, of um, heavenly images and the cultural function of this. He made a, a round, or it, it, it was a, a round um, space, and you could go from primitive ages to, um, to the Renaissance, to Dürer, uh, to Kepler in the, at the last. Um, and this, of course, they were connected, the primitive, and then you arrived at Kepler's. And so you could say, oh, this is a simple circle. And when you arrived in a certain degree of enlightenment, like Kepler did, you have to start from again. But no, there was a staircase leading you up to the library. There was a special library, and you could force yourself out of the circle by going on with your own research on the topic. So this is a perfect metaphor, um, a circle which has hope to, to, to be left and to be developed into a certain kind of uh, degree of enlightenment. And he made it very openly with a quotation um, and a painting uh, declaring humanity has to find its way to abstraction, from the monster to abstraction, um, and, but the pendulum will swing back. So he, and then, of course, with his library, he did not actually embrace 
abstraction, right? He did not order the books, for instance, alphabetically or using some kind of uh, index system, mm -hmm. but he actually arranged them using this kind of uh, law of elective affinities, right? Or good neighborship. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So he consciously did not take that step to using uh, some kind of abstract structuring system. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Samuel, should we perhaps open it up to the, uh, to the audience? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Uwe. That was a wonderful talk. Um, Thanks. I'd like to put to you, as you know, I, I've been thinking about Warburg and presence. Uh, I've been thinking about Warburg and presence, the presence of the artwork for a long time. And I'd like to put the following to you, uh, that the presence of the image destroys the art historical discourse. Mm -hmm. But what you, I think, can see in Warburg's um, uh, in but also the exhibition plates he made, and which your wonderful talk, uh, the comparison with Sarkis, I think, makes very clear is that there's this kind of tension between the presence, the life of the artwork, the Nachtleben, mm -hmm. the return of these pathos formulas, which nobody can explain when people suddenly imitate attitudes they cannot have known from classical examples, mm -hmm. and which in that way disrupt historical uh, consecutive uh, continuity, mm -hmm. and the kind of presence or juxtaposition of um, elements from different parts of the past that Barbour creates in these uh, exhibition panels. So I think there's a continuous tension in this work between presence and Nachtleben, mm -hmm. on the one hand, and the uh, representation of the art historical discourse. Yeah, yeah, and, and this connects perfectly um, to what Sven has said, because um, if you assume um, that it's the aim of the art historian to declare the artwork as not living anymore, so you don't have to be afraid of it anymore, um, then you would, would also kill the living possibilities of the artwork. So you have to stand the idea that these artworks have a, a life at their own, but you have to come to a, to a degree that you accept this life and you understand as well that they cannot endanger you. Du lebst und tust mir nichts. You're living, but you're not attacking me. Um, this is one of the, the, the key phrases of his uh, in, in, this, in this aspect. But we're also talking about a transformative practice here, right? This is presence transformed. This Warburg went into all kinds of archives. He combines works in different media or mediums, works on paper, paintings, uh, all kinds of documents, and uh, he makes these uh, combinations. So what we have here is, is a form of presence, perhaps, but it's no longer, um, let's say, a pre-photographic presence, right? It's been integrated into Warburg's imaginary museum, his Musée Imaginaire. Yeah, 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 he's, he's, um, um, he's speaking about himself as an actor. Uh, when 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 uh, talking about his performances in in the Herziana in Rome, for example, yeah, and and what is very interesting um, the, concerning the Musée Imaginaire he creates, um, for example, even on this screen you have not only artworks but you have artworks you have you have a, a portfolio of artworks um, or reproductions of artworks that he created himself. Um, and then he reintegrates as in his own uh, screens. And sometimes he makes photographs of previous exhibitions and reintegrated them in the screens. And you have a mise en abime of, of images, perhaps on those photos, three, four dimensions, quoting himself, citing himself. And here you have the Laocoon, um, a very important piece from his student years. One of his first um, art historical papers was on the uh, on um, La Ocon, and he compared his own face becoming ill um, with 
uh, and, and trying to, to regain the sophrosyne, the self-control, with the self-control the antiquity expresses in the Laocoon. So there is multiple layers of self-references, and of course of reference to other cultural phenomena also. Warburg also Warburg, uh, characterized his own writing style, and he really struggled as a writer, obviously. He characterized his own writing style as, as uh, Allsuppenstiel, eel soup style. I, I don't know if it, it, if it was a conscious reference to the Laocon, but it always mm -hmm. reminds me yeah. of the Laocon. Yeah, but Allsuppen, um, it's a German word, or even Germans do not understand. Allsuppen <laughs> is not eel soup, oh, it's, okay. it's soup of everything. It's Hamburg dialect. Oh, it's a melange of everything, Altsuppenstil. Okay. But even Hamburg people uh, do not know this. Okay. Yet. Okay. I'm glad. I yeah, and and if you have ever experienced um, to uh, have to read and edit um, his texts in, the, uh, in his Nachlass, uh, it's, it's hard to read because he's repeating, restarting constantly, and he's never thrown a single sheet of paper away uh, through his life. And, uh, this is hard, hard work to, to fight yourself through this also. Are there any other questions? No? Okay, then maybe I suggest we take our break a bit earlier um, and then we start again at 6.30 uh, with a conversation first between Iwa and Sarkis about the treasure chest of Mosine followed by a talk between Alexander Singh and Sarkis about one of the texts in uh, that book. So we meet again here at 6.30. Uh, on the first floor now, there is some soup and drinks for you to enjoy. Thank you. Yeah.